Welcome to The Compassionate Revolution, a show for independent-minded Americans who are forging a new way forward for American politics and culture. Hello and welcome to The Compassionate Revolution. I'm June Cleese, your host, and today on the show, um, we are featuring Dr. Sandra Cosgrove. This is going to be one of uh, the first of three interviews we're going to do this summer as we um, discuss the organization that she helped to found, uh, Vote Nevada. And uh, I'd like, if you would, Sandra, please introduce yourselves, uh, yourself, excuse me, for our guests. Sometimes I feel like it's, like it's themselves, but it's just me, <laughs> just me. So um, I'm Sandra Cosgrove. I'm a history professor at the College of Southern Nevada in Las Vegas. And um, I was at the League of Women Voters for quite a while. And then we decided to start our own very state-based, so Nevada-based organization called Vote Nevada. And really, I think we're at a time where, because of technology and a lot of other things, we need organizations that are not top down. We need a lot more stuff that's bottom up because every state's different. I mean, even in Nevada, Northern Nevada, rural Nevada, urban Nevada, we're different. And if you're not talking to people on the ground, you're going to miss the mark because you're not going to hear the feedback that you need to hear. So mm -hmm. when we started Vote Nevada, we said we want to be different. And the one way we're different is instead of having like priority issues where we go around saying, here's our issues, you have to support them. We have some issues. We work on behavioral and mental health. That's an issue. We work mm -hmm. on, you know, healthy communities. That's an issue. But more so, we work on problem solving through civics. Because yeah. what, we, what we find is when, when I talk to people and I say, well, what do you need? They're like, I have this problem. I think I know what, what needs to be done, but I don't know who to talk to. I don't know if it's a legislature. I don't know if it's my congressperson. Is this a city council? I don't know who to talk to. And so right. sometimes people don't even know where to start. And so I sit and I have them walk me through it. They might, I might say, oh, okay, that's going to be the county commission. Let me okay. show you where their website is. Let me tell you what their process is. Here's where you need to start yeah. in order to be able to be heard. And there's a lot of people are, who are not being heard because they don't know where to start. Right. And a lot of that, unfortunately, seems to be tied to the fact that we don't emphasize civics education in the way we did, hey? Exactly. Exactly. And so people don't even know, like the old, remember our school has rock? I mean, even though, you know, how you became the bill becomes a law song, people will go, I know there's this thing on YouTube. Is this the way it works? I don't know. But, but at every level of government, things are a little bit different. And so right. sometimes people just need a little point in the right direction. And then maybe sometimes some help kind of crafting what, do, how do you speak and what do you do and what's the process? There right. seems to be a huge need for that. And I think it boils down to the fact also we don't do civics education, but things are so hyper-partisan yeah. that the political parties don't spend a lot of time just at helping people to understand how to solve problems because they're too busy arguing with each other, scoring partisan points. Right, right. And so the whole idea of what makes a healthy democracy function, a healthy republic function, gets kind of tossed to the side as, a, as an afterthought. Yes. And in reality, what we need to do is really anchor people to understanding the systems linked to civics, linked to self-governance, right? Exactly. You, you have a whole summer planned. Of whole events. summer, exactly. Amazing. That is amazing. And, in, and in, in that spirit and in that philosophy, and on, on the program, we're going to, like we said, we're going to do three episodes. We're going to try and highlight aspects of that work that you're doing all summer and hear about some of the exciting things that, that come out of it. Um, and so before the launch, we're, we, we have two topics we said we'd want to talk about tonight. We're going to talk about economic uh, development opportunity uh, and then uh, workforce development, those two pieces of, of this summer of civics that, uh, project. So the, the economic development one is about tied to bird watching. Could bird you watching. Awesome. Tell us more. Right. So, um, Sometimes people will say we need a third political party. I say we need more direct democracy. So in many states, the initiative, the referendum recall, there's all kinds of mechanisms for direct democracy, but I want to expand that out and say, you know what, let's just pick things that aren't getting done and do them. And so you might not associate direct democracy with economic development, but I do. Um, and so uh, my partner is a bird watcher. And I remember when we first started dating, I was thinking this was kind of a frivolous white people thing thinking, all right, okay, I guess if this floats your boat, whatever. But then I started realizing that if you really look at the Audubon Society, if you really look at ornithology, birds are literally the canary in the coal mine. If you wanna know about climate change, ask how the birds are doing, because they will tell you. Mm 
Mm, and yeah. and so there is a lot of science behind bird watching that can be used to prove climate change right now. Mm. And so we kicked that off with a meeting about there was a, a, a huge bird die off in New Mexico about a year ago where birds yeah. literally just fell out of the sky and died. Mm -hmm. And so an ornithologist there um, came in and they had her do necropsies and little autopsies on the birds. And she said these birds were starving to death. They literally starved to death and fell out of the sky. And so what she did is she said, these are migratory birds and they come through Colorado to New Mexico, heading down to Southern Texas. She said, I looked at the weather and what was happening in Colorado. And there was this bizarre uh, snowstorm that usually by that point it's spring and there's, there's plants and there's insects and there's all this food. And so mm -hmm. the birds arrived in Colorado and there was snow, not food. And so they just kept mm. flying because there was nothing to eat. And by the time they got to New Mexico, they were starved. They died. Wow. Interesting. And so we said, okay, well, we need more citizen science that way. That's an easy way to access citizen science. And so maybe we could tie this to an economic development plan. Mm. So I talked to the local Audubon people here and I said, do we have migratory birds? Do we have bird watching places? And I know we do because my partner drags me to them, but we do. <laughs> and I said, well, how much time do we, we spend promoting bird watching in Nevada? Because Nevada's tourism, we're tourism central. How right. often we, do we say, maybe spend some time on the strip and then drive out to um, the Mount Charleston and see the birds that are out there or to the wetlands park or to Corn Creek? How often do we do, we do that? We don't. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, maybe, maybe there's folks who would come to Las Vegas and spend, see a show if they were going to be able to do bird watching too. Mm -hmm. So I, I started meeting with some students and some teachers. And I said, this, this sounds like something that high school and junior high, maybe even elementary kids oh, could do. Oh yeah. Let's do some research on migratory birds that come through birds that live here all the time. How many places there are where birds, you know, congregate, maybe what the climate change is here. And then let's write an economic development plan on how we might advertise out and say, come do birding tourism here mm -hmm. and, and what that would look like and maybe how many extra dollars that could bring in. And then if we're gonna have, if we want more birds to come to Clark County or to come to any city in Nevada, maybe we could talk to our water authority, which pays people to take their grass out and to put yeah. natives plants in. Maybe they could have a page on the water authority's website that said, these are native plants that birds can eat. There you go. Yeah. And we could do like a beautification neighborhood beautification that's bird friendly. Interesting. Very and everybody's very excited about that. That's awesome. That and is so, really awesome. So we figured that would be like an inclusive economic development where it would be bottom up. Right. Right. Where we and would write the plans. To, to look at, you know, you've got the blend between social science and, and the natural sciences there, don't you? Exactly. And then the Audubon folks could take people out for field trips and we could, they could learn about birding and, and that way we would have another generation coming up that would be citizen scientists. Yeah. Yeah. And then, so from there, I I'm hoping that we'll be able to spin this off into other grassroots economic development ideas. Cause right. I'm sure there's probably in Las Vegas, 500 people out there going, this could be a thing if someone would just listen to me. Okay. Well, well, we've got a platform. Let's, let's start giving people voice and, and pushing that up to the governor's office and saying, what about this? So it's, it's almost like, you know, in, in the bird watching, you're kind of piloting a methodology for civic engagement, right? Exactly. So we're going to want to make sure that we're doing that. We're documenting everything we're doing. This is how we did our research. This is how we wrote it. This is who we talked to. So that it then becomes a model. Right. That other people can look at and do it on their, on their own. Yeah, exactly. Which, which allows people to be more, more citizens to be more empowered. Right. Exactly. And we would want to document that we talk to the water authority. We're probably going to talk to the county commission that we're going to talk to the government's office of economic development, that we might need a legislator so that people see the points where we had to be civically engaged. Exactly. And so it really breaks it down and spells out that process and becomes that how to manual for folks. And, and it also, to me, I think spells out clearly that when, you know, a lot of people, when they think about civics and civic engagement, it's all how a bill becomes a law kind of thing. And, the, and then there's this broader field of engagement that is very, you know, based on what, what is near and dear to your heart and how do you engage with the systems of society and government right. to, to, to advance and, and, and um, make those, those civic dreams happen. Right. And we want to say you, so we, the people, you have absolute authority and power to do this. It doesn't have to be a legislator. It doesn't have to be a bureaucrat. It doesn't even have to be an adult. An adult. 
Yeah, there you, you go. You can do it because we, the people, are in the Constitution and we have those powers. That's right. First, first three. It's right. First three. So yep. be be empowered. It's, and even if even if all we do is just put these on our website and tweet about them and talk about them, I think that's at least a first step. Sure sounds like it. Absolutely. And, and that and then, you know, the people that are going to be looking over time are going to find those pathways through those examples. That's exactly. Amazing. Yeah. Very, so, very. So then related to that is workforce development. So jobs. Right. Yep. And, and everybody's talking about jobs right now because the president has uh, an infrastructure economic development plan he's putting through Congress. Every state's kind of doing some stuff right now. Yep. But um, I work with the disability community a lot here. And one of the things that they, they, I've heard from them is when the state brings in a new company, so let's say we brought in Tesla and we did, we did an agreement with them. We gave them tax abatements. We said for a certain number of years, you don't have to pay certain types of taxes because you're going to come in and provide jobs. But in, in, we want to say, we're going to give you tax abatements, but then you have to enter into an agreement saying you're going to hire Nevadans. The jobs need to be for Nevadans and a certain percentage mm-hmm. and the wages have to be a certain uh, a certain rate. So there's right. an agreement and they're called community benefits agreements. Right. And other companies, you know, say that they're going to that they'll pave a road or they'll bring Internet to a neighborhood. And so we said, why can't it say if it says you're going to hire certain you're going to hire a certain percentage of Nevada workers? Why can't it say in five percent have to be people with disabilities? or mm-hmm. otherly able, able. Mm-hmm. 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 and we know now lots of jobs could be done from home mm-hmm. so somebody True. could be processing appointments so there's lots of things we can do from home now yeah. so it, it's not a barrier to have someone who maybe has a, a disability to hire them and right. so we started saying well we need to then write a proposal up and send it to the governor's office and say hey this group is not being included when you are speaking for Nevadans we want them at the table Mm-hmm. And then, and then we started thinking about okay, so the president's talking about infrastructure construction jobs, and to me that kind of sounds like trickle down because mm-hmm. I was looking and I'm like, well, where's the jobs for people with mental illness? Where's the jobs for people with disability? Where's the jobs for the moms that are working at home? It's mostly like we're going to have jobs that are going to go down to the unions, and then it's supposed to trickle down to the rest of us. I don't. Yeah. Where's the rest of the plan that makes it more inclusive? Right. Because I would like to actually have that built in because I have, I have the same problem with trickle down tax cuts as I do trickle down jobs. Right, 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 right. I don't know that it's actually going to trickle down to the folks who, who need the help, too. Right. So the, the basic premise then is to, you know, as the things are happening at a larger national level that, you know, OK, that's going to play out how that's going to play out. Right. But there are things and that's what you're saying with the community benefits agreement that I'm hearing is that. You can make this. You can take these steps and 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 move in this direction now. You don't necessarily have to wait for whatever may trickle your way. Exactly, and 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 so for like for you and I, that that are we um, don't have a disability, or you know maybe we don't have a disability that's impeding our ability to have a job. Right. We need to then be saying, and I think they should have jobs too because mm-hmm. I'm fulfilled and can pay bills and do all that. They should be able to. So if it's possible. I'm going to advocate for that. Right. Right. And make sure that make sure that when we're writing these types of things, we're being as inclusive as we possibly can. Right. And so in terms of your summer of civics in this particular, um, you know, focus, what, what, what activities do you have planned on that front? So what I'm doing is I'm chairing the subcommittee with our independent living uh, council here. And what we're doing is kind of brainstorming. How do we make sure that as we're in a small committee talking about something, Who do we want to invite? We want Lieutenant Governor to come to our next meeting. We want to show up at the next legislative hearing. You know, we want to make sure that we're writing a a report that can go to the governor's office to make sure it's not just our little echo chamber where we're saying, sure, we should have inclusive workforce development. We need to make sure that that is put gets put on somebody's political agenda. Right. Because the people I work with, they're voters. They vote. Mm -hmm. Their voice should be heard. So, mm-hmm. so trying to figure out from their perspective, how do we make sure that their small group, comparatively, mm-hmm. gets the same type of um, voice or platform that the larger group is getting? How do we amplify that? I amplify those, those voices in the community to be more inclusive and to benefit the whole of the community to the greatest possible 
level that you can. Exactly. Like civic processes, right? Under, in this case, your state constitution. Exactly. And, and for me to be able to say that if I have students that are looking for a service learning opportunity, or I've got community members saying, I'm retired now, what things could I be working on? You know, I want to plug in. I want to be able to do more than just say, oh, support voting rights. I mean, these things, that's important. But actually roll your sleeves up and show up at this committee that I'm on because I need somebody that you, you have the ability to write reports. I need somebody to help me help us so that we're writing a really snazzy one page report that can go over to the governor's office. Exactly. And so you're building on the strengths that people have as they walk in the door, essentially, you know, the people that yep. show up. You build on the strengths and, all, of course, also the ideas and the lived experiences of these individuals. But in terms of the rolling up your sleeves part, you know, that is, that's where many hands, you know, make lighter work. And, and you can build that in sense of not only the, the reality of inclusion, not just the sense of it, but the reality of inclusion. And then uh, also help further advance the skills people have, or maybe if they're willing, further get, you know, develop those skills, right? Which is the compassionate thing to do, Right. 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 It's not. It's not just say I'm, I'm in here to benefit just me, but right. I've got some. I've got some time to be altruistic. Who exactly. Who needs? I've got skills and, and talents. Who needs my help? Right. Right. That offering of self to the community in in the ways that make sense to what you can do, and I think that's the piece that what you're doing with this uh, summer of civics speaks a, a lot of volumes on is because not only is it diverse in many ways, you know. But as these different these different topics sort of, I don't know if I want to describe it as a wheel per se, but it sort of goes around that element of what makes civic engagement, civic engagement, I mean, right. it, you know, and that there's a place for, for you there. You, you don't have to take on the whole world, right? right? Just find your niche. And, and this is what this, this summer of civics, I think, offers people out that way. Because people will say to me, I work all day. I don't have time to do testimony at a public hearing, or I don't have a whole lot of time to learn a bunch of things that I don't already know. Right. And so if I can say, June, you're a historian. I need you to do some birding research for me. I've got some fifth graders that need a little help. Right. That's naturally in your wheelhouse. Right. I mean, in your mind, you're like, yeah, I can do that. Right. Exactly. Right. So building on those strengths and, and um, developing really that civic community from there, that's, it's, and I notice, notice that no part of this do I do I talk about partisan sniping or advancing a political agenda. Yep, take take that stuff out of the mix because exactly. it's again we the people, right, right, doing doing self governance, doing the work of democracy. Beautiful, beautiful approach, really taking it out of that partisan camp and putting it back to the people. Themselves. And there, people are frustrated because they get tired of the partisan back and forth when they just want to solve a problem, just get something done. That's and for sure. so, so let's not waste time forming a third political party. Mm -hmm. Let's take that direct democracy heritage that we've had for at least 100 years. Although, interestingly, I was doing um, research on the initiative, the initiative oh. and the referendum, and I know it goes back to the progressive period. Right. Actually, James Madison and Thomas Jefferson talked about it when the Constitution was being written and mm -hmm. when the Bill of Rights were, were being written. Hmm, there you go. So that, that anchors it even further into the intellectual history of the country. And apparently it goes back into English political tradition that there were times where, because people didn't have voting rights, they were kind of virtually represented. You could petition the government, right. even yeah. if you didn't have voting rights. And apparently there were a lot of women, there were a lot of people of color, there were a lot of poor people. That was the avenue that they took. Mm. And it got, it kind of got pushed to the side as we expanded voting rights. But as we know, they expanded voting rights, but not for women and not for people of color. And then they took the petition away from them. Right. And so it was the, the progressives that said, no, we're going to add it back in so that we have both. Right. Give, give people voting rights and allow them to petition. Right. Right. And so a little bit of that history from, you know, going further back, but then specifically thinking about what you mentioned with the progressives in the late, uh, late 19th, early 20th century, that era you know, and of course that term in different eras, right, can mean different things. So yes. we want to make sure we make a note of that historically situated thing. Cause, yeah, because people nowadays think it's that stupid online petition that I just signed that nobody's going to read. Not that. Right. Not right. that one. No, no right. petition is literally like a, an initiative or a referendum. It's literally making a demand. Right. Yeah, exactly. With From the power that you hold. 
Exactly. I live here. I pay taxes here because a lot of times women and people of color were paying taxes, even if they didn't have the right to vote. So mm-hmm. you could petition as a taxpayer. Right. And make that demand. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. And those are pieces that people don't know about unless they either dive in deep themselves. Right. Or, um, you know, they attend things or watch programs like this where you get that sense of that, uh, that history in the mix of it. It's not that you need exactly. to do that deep dive yourself, but just ask those questions, right? You know, what is the history of this, right? And as I start to embark on this journey, so yes, exactly. So Sandra, anything else you'd like to highlight before we sign off for our, our, uh, just, just this, I think we're at a point in time because again, of technology and how we can communicate and the power that we, the people now have, because we can do so many things across space and time, Mm -hmm. it's time to make direct democracy equal to representative democracy Mm -hmm. and to have both operating at the same time. Mm -hmm. Because there's a, there's a room for each, right? And we've had room and we've built in room for each for a long time. It's been there, but I think one has been dormant a little bit because things had to be top down because it was hard to organize and you had to have a lot of money. Yeah. I think the internet, the way we can communicate and interact has, has leveled that playing field. So it's just, it's the price of a Zoom subscription that you and I can be sitting here talking. Right, it helps, it helps. Of course, we do have that huge technological divide, right, the, and social media divide, but it definitely yep. helps move things away from that, like you said, that, that heavy, heavy top-down structure. But that needs to be our number one priority for all of us, is to get rid of that digital divide. So mm-hmm. that, that kids are not being left out of school, so that we can do telehealth, so that there's economic opportunity. That's really the linchpin for everything right now. So for instance, you know, in the 1950s, it was the highway system to make sure we could move things around. Now yeah. it's our internet highway system has got to be built up. Right. And that's that right there is a topic for a whole nother episode. Hey? Yeah, it certainly is. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Oh, I thank really you for having me. I always get so night. excited when I talk to you. Yes, yes, it's always yes I know. And I'm looking forward to um, episode two. And by then we'll have some more of, of what's been unfolding too. So some yes. more stories. And if you want to bring anybody on with you who's been participating, that'd be great too. We'd love to hear from uh, some of the folks out there with you doing this work as well. And awesome. so we'll, uh, we'll look forward to that sometime again here in the summer. And I'd like to thank everybody for tuning into the Compassionate Revolution. Have a good day. Thank you for watching The Compassionate Revolution on the Compassionate American Network on YouTube. We're glad you stopped by. Do you know of individuals or organizations we should highlight on one of our programs? Please email us at compassamerica76 at gmail.com. Thank you.